A COM 400 Project by Katie Craig and Justin Dacko of Inside an Angry Sky. Inside an Angry Sky tells the thrilling and informative tale of Langevici as he pilots his own bonanza across America chasing a winter storm that originated in the northern area of the Pacific. Langevici and two other pilots travel across America in order to find the most exhilarating weather to fly in. The types of weather that they encountered throughout their trip include heavy turbulence, heavy icing, rain, hail, sleet, and even lightning near the end of it. Langevici even goes as far to admit that he is a bit of a thrill chaser. The main concern throughout their flight was icing. Because their Bonanza was not equipped with any anti or de-icing capabilities, that meant that any icing conditions that they faced must have been avoided or minimized at all costs. This would be done by either watching forecasts for any kind of freezing precipitation or any kind of temperature that would be conductive to icing. Also, any icing conditions that were met along the way during the flight had to have been avoided by either climbing or descending to an altitude where the temperature was either too low or too high for icing to stick to the plane. Another alternative was planning retreats to separate airports at different legs of the flight. Langevici even mentions that sometimes you need to plan a retreat even for a retreat. Throughout the story, Langevici also goes into different topics that regard storm flying, such as why storm flying is important to pilots, the history and use of forecasting for pilots, and why icing is such a dangerous concern. The storm started over the North Pacific as a low pressure system created by unequal cooling of the Earth's surface. After three days, a winter storm was created, centered 500 miles west of the Alaskan Panhandle, sending a cold front south to California. The storm faded after its climb across the mountains, but gained strength when it hit a cold air mass that had come in from Canada and extended across the United States. The storm was forecasted to move fast across the Mississippi and create near blizzard conditions near Lake Michigan. The storm was supposed to move quickly to Massachusetts. The storm instead slowed over the Mississippi and became a near stationary front across the Virginias. Along the stationary front, warm, sluggish southern air was trying to climb the dense Arctic air that it had parked at low altitude over the northeast. The storm center had floated east from the Mississippi River to the hills of West Virginia. The warm front from the night before had buckled and jammed against New England's stubborn winter. Just below it, the mid-Atlantic states remained blocked in ice and would be for the rest of the day. However, a classic cold front now curved south, centered along the west slope of the Appalachians out across Jackson, Mississippi, and into the Gulf of Mexico. The front was moving slowly and bringing poor weather. By morning, the storm center had crossed Nantucket and was heading into the North Atlantic where within a day, deprived of its sustaining temperature differences, it quietly collapsed into the Icelandic low. We planned to fly to Seattle, toward the storm center. However, we were likely to be blocked by heavy icing and rain. The challenge for us to find a way through around such conditions rather than go through them. However, all forecasts seemed uncertain, so we decided to leave the storm temporarily and jump east to Kansas City. We would have to hope that the storm would survive the mountain crossing. So we flew all day at 200 miles per hour from San Francisco to Kansas City. As we crossed over the Rockies, we checked the weather by radio. It seemed like the weather would continue to worsen and block us at the final phase of flight due to lack of fuel. However, we kept going and planned a retreat even from our retreat. After dark at 10,000 feet, we had hit the weather. The clouds around inside were pitch black. During descent, we picked up a bit of frosting, but we broke through cloud a mile from the runway and landed with plenty of fuel. The next day, we planned to fly a 500 mile run to South Bend, Indiana. We took off and climbed into warm gray clouds at 9,000 feet. At the moment, we had two specific concerns, the possibility of icing at our altitude ahead and the certainty of it ahead directly below. As we approached the Mississippi, we asked for updates on the weather. They were calling for low ceilings, snow and freezing temperatures. Kansas City, one of our retreat plans, was also calling for freezing temperatures. We decided to push on. We ran out of warm air and our wings began to ice over at an alarming rate. We descended to 7,000 feet and found clear air between cloud layers. 
Trying to find warm air, we maneuvered between cloud layers, climbing once to 13,000 feet. At some point, we found an area with temperatures that had dropped to minus 5, where clouds consisted of frozen crystals that bounced harmlessly off our wings. Here, we could plan for South Bend. From South Bend, we taxied out and planned to head for Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. By the time we got out, the visibility dropped to a third of a mile in heavy snow. This visibility, we could, in theory, make the runway if we needed to come back. The conditions ahead were looking the same. The only good news was that the temperatures looked too cold for icing to threaten us. We took off and were swallowed by cloud. The effect was immediate and dramatic. The ground vanished so quickly that it might have never existed. The clouds were rough, but it was the psychological severity of this transition from the ground to the weather that had made the aircraft hard to control. I asked the pilot next to me at the controls to stop throwing switches, to stop writing down frequencies and fuel settings, to stop listening to Morse identifiers of navigational systems, and please simply to concentrate on flying. A good pilot is one who knows when not to follow procedures. Night came at 9,000 feet in continuing cloud and snow. Over eastern Ohio, we broke suddenly into clear air of an arctic night. The lights of Cleveland hit the northern horizon. The air mass boundary lay just to our south in the black wall of cloud from which we had just emerged. In the morning, we awoke to heavy snowfall outside the hotel. When we got to the airport, a DC-9 climbing out of Harrisburg reported heavy icing from the surface all the way to 16,000 feet. These conditions grounded us for a time being and forced us to wait for a break. Throughout human history, there has always been a fascination with weather. Aristotle was the first known to separate the atmosphere from the heavens. He wrote the first unified weather theory titled Meteorologica in 340 BC. 2,000 years later, René Descartes doubted his methods and applied new rigor to the ignoring of God in weather prediction. He is essentially the father of modern meteorology. He suffered from lack of weather data because in the 17th century, the basic instruments for measuring the air were still being invented. It wasn't until the 1800s that with the invention of the telegraph, news about the weather could travel faster than the weather itself. This increased the general public's interest in accurate weather forecasting. Today, national governments have set up weather services to collect observations and issue forecasts. The general public is under the impression that weather forecasting is still very inaccurate. But if they verified all the forecasts, including all the times that no rain was forecasted and then it didn't rain, they would find that forecasting nowadays has an accuracy of over 90%. New and inexperienced pilots are taught to avoid all weather. This includes hail, icing, turbulence, wind shear, updrafts, and downdrafts. This can instill a fear of flying through less than perfect weather. The general public has a very similar fear of flying through poor weather, brought on by how these types of flights are portrayed in the media. Chaos in the skies. Brutal weather conditions causing aviation disasters. It looked like a bomb went off. A violent hailstorm shatters cockpit windshields and destroys a jet's engines. It looked like he'd been beat with a hammer. A powerful downdraft slams a 160-ton jet into rush hour traffic. And a plane was coming over just like that, and I know this can't be real. And a vicious tailwind tosses an Airbus down a rain-slicked runway. You could feel yourself almost leaving the seat of the airplane. Ferocious storms can mean catastrophe in the skies. I thought, Lord, I've never seen anything like this. I didn't see how we weren't knocked right out of the sky. Eyewitnesses and survivors tell their gripping stories. It takes an experienced pilot who has pushed the limits of what they are comfortable with doing to be able to tell the difference between weather that really needs to be avoided and weather that can be flown through safely. The pilots of this flight were experienced and skilled storm chasing pilots and were careful to take no unnecessary or dangerous risks. Stuck in Harrisburg, our break came in the mid-afternoon with a slight rising of the ceiling. We warned ATC that we would need an immediate return to Harrisburg if we found no way through the ice. We took off and climbed aggressively into the weather and found a way through it. 50 miles later, over the middle of Chesapeake Bay, we ran entirely out of weather and changed our direction to Richmond, Virginia, where we landed, refueled, and rethought the storm.
we went back into it after dark on our round trip to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, where the weather looked the worst. The flight did not begin dangerous, but it was rough and involved. At Wilkes-Barre, we turned south for Richmond. It was late at night. The storm had developed with unexpected strength. We stayed low, fighting 40 mile per hour headwinds at 3,000 feet. Outside Pennsylvania, I heard a splatter that sounded like sleet. We began to ice heavily. I shined a light on the wing and saw the ice growing like a viscous parasite. It looked white and crusty on the leading edge and clear where it streamed back over the wing. Within a minute, we had taken more than an inch, a rate of accumulation that required immediate action. We gambled on a quick climb to 7,000 feet where we found warm Georgian air that melted the ice and slid it from our wings. Had the gamble of that climb not paid off and fast, we would have fallen back on our second plan. A quick retreat downwind into the frigid air north and a high speed approach to a long runway. Having found the layer of warm air, we crept comfortably through the clouds to Richmond, welcoming the moisture rolling up our windshield, listening to the first reports of freezing rain on the surface of New Jersey. Icing on any airplane is a serious situation, but it is especially dangerous for airplanes with no equipment to prevent ice from forming or to remove ice that has already formed. If ice is allowed to accumulate, it disturbs the lifting airflow across the wings and tail and causes them eventually to stop flying. Icing on an airplane has many negative effects on its flying characteristics. It increases the amount of drag, increases the speed at which the airplane will stall, and decreases the amount of thrust that's produced. Icing forms as a result of supercooled water droplets freezing on impact with the surface of an aircraft. It most commonly forms when flying in cloud above the freezing level and when flying through freezing precipitation. Icing on the wings disrupts the smooth airflow which is needed to produce lift. The leading edge icing significantly destroys the lift. When the wings stall, the airplane does one of two things. It could descend into a flat, mushing, semi-controllable impact with the ground, or it could shudder, drop its nose, maybe roll, and hit the ground much harder. When ice forms on the horizontal stabilizer, there is the possibility of a tailplane stall. In this situation, the airplane dives violently and irreversibly. It may gain so much speed that it breaks apart before it hits the ground. When ice forms on a propeller, it destroys thrust in the same manner as it destroys lift on the wing. It can also be thrown off and hit the wing or fuselage and cause damage. Airport crews spray ice off with de-icing fluid and coat the wings in anti-icing fluid to prevent ice from building before takeoff. If there is a delay before takeoff, the ice may form again and the crews will need to spray it again. Some airliners have crashed because of the inconvenience of taxiing back for the second de-icing. The areas where icing is most critical and legally must be removed before takeoff are the wings, the horizontal stabilizer, the vertical stabilizer, the control surfaces, and propellers. Ice builds faster on thinner surfaces. Airliners are protected from icing to a certain extent by heating the leading edges of the wings or by having rubber boots on the leading edges which inflate to break ice off. General aviation airplanes are usually not equipped with these devices, so they are not allowed to be flown in an area with known icing. The Bonanza used for this flight had no de-icing or anti-icing equipment. Richmond in the morning was cloudy. The weather service had an office at the airport. We walked in to sample the informed opinion there and one of us made it a joke about the unexpected rain in New Jersey. After climbing from Richmond through warm cloud layers, we flew over coastal North Carolina, where we could turn west and head directly for the front. The route from there would take us over the heights of the Smoky Mountains, past Asheville, North Carolina, and down into Knoxville, where within the hour, the airport had been forecasting a 500 foot overcast ceiling and two miles of visibility in heavy rain. We climbed over the mountains against 60 mile per hour headwinds. A dark wall marked the front ahead. As we approached, we made out bulbous and hooked cloud shapes indicating powerful turbulence. On board, our storm scope showed distant lightning strikes 50 miles out. We strapped down hard into our seats and our ride kept getting rougher. The weather at Asheville 
one of our escape routes, if the weather had become unflyable here, had dropped nearly to the limits of an instrument approach. We considered diverting while we still could, but got a report that Knoxville, our destination, was holding steady, so we continued westward. We crossed the highest mountains. The storm scope showed lightning strikes off to our right wing and ahead to the left. We could hear crackling on the radio, which is an indication for lightning. Airplane repairs are expensive, so we grew concerned when the raining started to turn to sleet, the lightning strikes became more frequent, and our radios began to hiss and fade. Having an escape plan is a very important part of storm flying. Airplanes give pilots plenty of time to consider possible trouble, but when the trouble hits, it hits fast. Retreating means climbing, descending, turning, or slowing to save fuel. Pilots are required to confront their worst fears when preparing those options and preparing for the event that they fail. Unfocused anxiety is one of the emotions pilots must avoid. Circumstances in the atmosphere combine to kill pilots who are wishful or distracted, and safety depends on being ready to retreat. Storm flying in a small, slow aircraft unequipped for icing involves slipping through a few miles at a time, judging and probing the clouds, moving higher and lower, turning, detouring, and rarely surrendering. Pilots are often told to know their limits in order to stop short of them, but there is no reason to enter into storm flying only to give ground. In flying, there is such a thing as being too careful. If pilots give in to their fears and don't push gently against them, they will turn around too soon and then the next time they will turn around even sooner. Eventually, they will turn around before takeoff, which is the unhappy fate of some pilots to choose finally never to fly again. Be ridiculous to say that we were not afraid. The sky had gathered around us in a malicious display of its power, but the control of fear is a necessary part of the inner work of a flight and one of the reasons, no doubt, that each of us was there. We still had an escape route open to us, a 180 degree turn to end a retreat downwind on compass alone. We talked it over and decided to keep going. Past the mountains, the weather eased and the static ceased and the navigational radio sprang crisply back to life. Soon after, we made contact with the Knoxville controller who made it a point to mention that we made it through some good cells. We had not seen the ground now for hours. We descended rapidly through continuing rain and cloud. About 10 miles back, we began the instrument approach into Knoxville. 500 feet off the ground, the clouds hinted at green fields. We emerged from the clouds, crossed the runway threshold, and touched down on the glistening runway, ending our little bit of storm chasing. Throughout the story, Langevici makes it a point to highlight why communication is such a valuable skill to have while storm flying. Not only is communicating with ATC and weather services required to get through a storm, but trusting and communicating with your co-pilot is one other essential skill to get through a flight. Any type of miscommunications with either ATC or between co-pilots could have disastrous consequences. During the last leg of the flight, Langevici and his two co-pilots lose their radios and their ability to communicate with ATC. This is where Langevici becomes most afraid during the flight. However, controlling fear, as Langevici says, is part of the experience. He was also able to still communicate with his two co-pilots, and because of this, he was able to make it through the storm and safely land. It is clear through the story that Langevici highly values the skill of storm flying. He goes into great detail as to why it is important. For example, handling fear and controlling the aircraft, as well as getting a better sense of the weather you're flying in. Any pilot armed with this under their belt can only succeed, just as long as they do not push their limits too far. That is another point Langevici goes into, that you must push against the limits as much as possible, but know when enough is enough. The only way to do that, however, is by continuously putting yourself into weather conditions and situations that require all of your attention and focus. If a pilot is too afraid to do this, they will be too afraid to enter any kind of cloud, and then eventually they will become too afraid to fly near any cloud, and eventually, Langevici warns, the pilot will be too afraid to take off.